Hey everybody, welcome to the Shape It Up podcast and today we have a special topic today because it is March 17th when I'm recording this podcast and the news and the social media feed is filled with stories of the coronavirus that is affecting everyone in the world. And today I wanted to really talk about how to feel powerful when your world is in chaos. So with everything that is going on with the coronavirus, there's, you know, social distancing is now a thing and there's no more hugging, no contact, which is even more socially isolating than we already are with our cell phones, our tablets, and our unlimited streams of escapism, like videos and movies and everything. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going and watching TV or anything like that. That's not my point is it's interesting because, you know, in this world of technology, you know, we always joke that our kids are always on the phone texting each other when they're sitting next to each other. So this is interesting to me that, you know, we're, we're now kind of being forced to not interact with each other. The other side of it is I think it's really interesting is because of the technology that we have today, we can reach so many people. So like even the fact that you're listening to this podcast right now, you know, I'm in Jersey. You could be listening to this and you could be in Alaska for all I know. The other option that we have with technology is, is that, you know, with video chat, this is how I work with most of my clients online, all my clients online. We do video conferences and video chats and discuss things. And it's, it, yes, there's a wall between actually physically being across from somebody, but it's interesting how we can kind of fill that gap. So there are a lot of people who are gripped in fear over the coronavirus. And there are also people that aren't really that concerned about the coronavirus. And then there's people in between. So what is it that makes one person have, you know, gripping fear and the other person not be concerned at all? So why is it that people have different takes on what is happening in the world or different ideas of what's really going on with the coronavirus. President Franklin Roosevelt had a great quote and it says, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So what is fear? So I looked up fear in the definition of fear is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, etc., whether the threat is real or imagined. If you follow me for any length of time, fear is really coming from our primitive brain. This is the brain, part of the brain that wants to keep us safe, wants to keep us in the cave, wants to you know, perpetuate um, us as human beings, which is awesome. <laughs> but the brain doesn't distinguish between what is real and what is imagined and different scenarios. And I really wanna stress that, like your brain could be freaking out based on real things, but it could also be imagined. This is just information. So when you feel fear, it's because of a thought that you're having. And that is, again, information. This is why somebody, you know, you can go up to them and talk about the coronavirus and someone is like deathly afraid. And then you could talk to another person about the same exact things that you said. And they're like, oh, I'm okay with it. It's not a big deal. It's the thoughts that they're thinking. So the number one fear that we have is death. Again, it goes back to our primitive survival. Obviously we want to keep procreating and keep the human race going. So death obviously is going to impede that a little bit. (laughs) But one of the things that I wanted to share today on the podcast is I wanted to share a story that not too many people know about. And um, I guess that's going to change because it's on the podcast, but January of 1990, I woke up and I could barely move my body because it had hurt so bad. Every inch of my body hurt and I was 17 years old and up until that day, I had been extremely active as a ballet dancer. And I still remember that day. It was like cement was running through my veins and it was just like weighing me down. Like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. I couldn't get out of bed. I just felt horrible. Three days later, I was admitted into the local hospital and I couldn't walk. I needed help to get out of bed, to go to the bathroom. I needed help to squeeze toothpaste out of 
a tube of toothpaste. I just, I didn't have any strength and, and it was so painful. I remember my mom telling visitors that were coming into the hospital to try not to cry when they saw me. And the local doctors, they had no idea what was going on. So after being in the local hospital for a while, they sent me up to Children's Hospital in Philly. And they were stumped too. They basically told my mom to be prepared for me to never be able to walk again and that I was probably gonna be blind. After a huge dose of what they told me of steroids, which seemed to temporarily help me, and after all the CHOP doctors doing what they felt they could, I was discharged from the hospital. Six months later, I had one more symptom that had led to a diagnosis and I was diagnosed with a type of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Two months later, I had a complete full recovery and I was dancing on scholarship at Radford University like nothing had happened. When I tell people this story, they seem horrified that I went through this, but as a 17 year old, it really was not a big deal to me. And I'm not sure why, don't know if it was because I was so young, but I also, I never, I never thought I was going to die and I never thought that I wasn't ever going to dance again. Like that was just, I don't even think that was an option in my brain. But what I do remember is the funny moments when I was sick and like when my mom would wheel me in the wheelchair <laughs> through the hospital, up at children's hospital. And I seriously, we joke about it now, but I seriously thought she was gonna chop my feet off because she kept running into the walls and she kept running into the doorways. So like imagine the wheel, you know that crazy wheel that sometimes you get at the grocery store that like spins out of control and makes a cart go off into different directions. Well, that's how I felt in the wheelchair when my mom was pushing it. I remember playing with the monitors in the hospital. <laughs> I would hold my breath for as long as I could and just to see the heart rate machine kind of I, I basically was waiting for the heart rate monitor to beep or do something or change the um, blips on the heart rate monitor and I am sure the nurses there loved that game as much as I did I'm sure they probably were cursing me out <laughs> checking me every five minutes I also remember sitting at home and running my finger over a book and my mom had come in and she saw what I was doing and she asked me, she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, if I'm going to be blind, I better learn Braille. And by the way, this book was not a Braille book. It was a regular book. So I was just running my fingers over flat words. And I also remember when I was finally allowed back into school and I, if I had missed one more day of school, I would have had a repeat senior year. So I was, I guess they maybe made me go back to school because they didn't want me to repeat. But I remember not being able to see the book that was directly in front of me, but I could see the book of the person that was sitting in front of me uh, clear as day. And this is from the eye drops that they had given me. It's like I had supervision, but nothing close up. I could see far away, like I could read detail and everything. Awesome people that helped carry my books for me. I got extra time when I had to walk up the steps in between classes. Uh, I got to clap the erasers because I really couldn't do much. I don't even know, like this was before computers for any of you that are younger, but I think I had trouble holding the pencil, you know, writing down things, that kind of thing. Plus I couldn't see what was in front of me. So <laughs> it was kind of hard to write down on a notebook. But yeah, clapping the erasers was a big thing. And if you are of the generation of erasers, you know exactly how exciting that was. My point is, for sharing the story, is I remember the funny moments of the experience. And I could have spiraled out into a deep depression about how my life was horrible and miserable and it would never be the same, And but I didn't. And this is not uh, uh, me, this is not to be taken as like I'm better than anyone because that is not true. But my perspective on the whole experience could have been any way I chose to experience it. So fear is really a state of mind. I could have been so fearful of my future being in that hospital, not knowing what was gonna happen. Whatever is going on around you is just circumstances. You get to decide what you wanna think and feel. You also get to react or not react. 
So taking the coronavirus or taking any situation that you're facing, what is the worst case scenario? In my mind, it's death, right? No longer living, which is again, our number one fear. But, but then what? I mean, I have no control over when my time is up and depending on what you believe or don't believe faith wise, you know, I, I could go at any second. I choose not to live my life thinking that every second of the day, but the fear of death is with us every second of every day. Do you know that most injuries leading to death are caused by falls in your house? Falling down in your house. You're more likely to die from falling down in your house. When I used to work as a physical therapist assistant, throw rugs were the biggest culprit of why people were falling in their house. Throw rugs. Not the coronavirus, not automobile accidents, it's like throw rugs, <laughs> something very simple. Death is all around us, but so is life. I choose to look at the coronavirus as a way for me to take a look at my life, to count my blessings, to be grateful for the life that I choose to live. I choose not to live in fear. I also choose to feel confident in my decisions to protect myself and my family, and you get to do that too. Managing your thoughts is how you gain your power back. Once you are aware that fear is just the thoughts that are running around in your head and what you make those thoughts mean to you, it doesn't mean that the fear is gone, but rather than resisting the fear and fighting with it, you feel the fear and you do what you need to do anyway. So if you're feeling helpless in this pandemic, ask yourself, what is the worst case scenario? and what action steps you can take to lessen the likelihood of your worst case happening. You can't control what other people think, do, or say, but you get to control what you think. And the best news is that no one can tell you what to think otherwise. I hope this podcast was helpful. Make sure you stay healthy, make sure you stay safe, make sure you manage your own mind.